You're tuned in to Night Vision Radio, exposing the truth one secret at a time. Prepare yourself as we explore the shadow worlds of suppressed history, secret knowledge, forbidden religion, and shine a light on the conspiracies to keep it all from us. Vision Radio. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm really excited about tonight's show. As you know, I'm your guest. I'm your host, Renee Barnett, and I have a really special guest uh, on with me tonight. And I, I really uh, put a lot of thought into uh, the guest that I wanted to have as my very first one for this new year. You know, I I know a lot of people have been through a lot over the past year. There's been a lot of craziness, a lot of divisiveness, and uh, a lot of people have had hard times and, uh, you know, are we're kind of happy to see 2017 come to an end and are looking forward to better days in 2018. But, you know, I think that when you want better days, you got to do something about it. You got to, if you want something different, you got to do something different. And so, that's why I invited my guest tonight, because she is just the person to help us out with that. My guest tonight overcame poverty and gang violence and flunking grades in school to eventually go on to launch 28 NASA missions, rocket rocket missions. But now she's applying that math and that science, along with some faith and intuition, to help us all reprogram our lives to reprogram our brains or rewire our brains. And she's going to also share with us just how she applied that in her own personal life in some very amazing ways. My guest tonight is Olympia LaPointe. And I'm talking to her tonight about her wonderful career at NASA, her early childhood, and about her brand new book, Answers Unleashed, The Science of Unleashing Your Brain's Power. Now, I can use a little of that. Welcome, Olympia. Hey, how are you? So It's so great to be on your show, Renee. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks for coming. I, you know, I, I just, I didn't realize we were such close neighbors. We could have done this in person. I, I have guests on, you know, from all over the world. So sometimes I have to get my guests up at 3.30 in the morning if they're in the UK or 4.30 in France. And uh, it's so nice to have someone in my time zone. And I don't feel like I'm imposing quite so much. Oh, no, <laughs> no. It's an honor to be on your show. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. You know, you know I was... I was Reading your book, and I was really impressed. You know, I'm always much more impressed with someone who has sort of gone through a lot of adversity and then, you know, sort of been able to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and make big, big changes in their lives. It's so much more impressive than someone who has kind of handed things or maybe born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And I think it's something to a lot of people today, a lot of people feeling down and out, disenfranchised. And we really have to take those matters into our own hands, I think, don't we, Olympia? And, and, and that's what you can help us with. Yes, uh, I, I totally agree with you. Uh 2018 is a fresh new year, and in order to walk through and create a fresh new life, we have to understand where we've come from and flip around the chaos from our past so we can actually transform it to where we need to go. And I talk about that in my new book, Answers Unleashed, The Science of Unleashing Your Brain's Power, in which I talk about my experiences. Now, people know me as a person who has launched rockets. They've watched the TED Talk. You know, they know that I launched 28 missions to space and, and sat in mission control and, and did great things. But 
I I have a backstory, and, and most of us have a backstory. Uh, things in which we've gone through very difficult that has the that's had shaped us, and it's either shaped us in a positive way or a negative way, and it's all depending on our choice, how we choose to view the situation, and how we choose to move forward from whatever happens. Uh, my life is uh, no different, but I, I went through a lot of very difficult things in my life that would uh, just completely make some people cringe. <laughs> and, but I, the great news is that I learned to overcome it and come through it. And this is what I learned in this process. Uh, to give you a little bit of backstory about my own life, uh, I grew up in poverty uh, with a single mother uh, and three sisters. And we didn't have food at all to we just didn't have food at all growing up and it was so exciting to go to school because not only did I have a chance to learn, I had a meal. That's how it was. And mm. it was, it was, uh, it was an interesting time period. It was not the 1980s when I went to high school. I'll, I'm dating myself and I'll just, I'll just tell everyone right now I'm 41. I'm relatively young. Um, but uh, I went through that and the life changing moment was when I was, when, when I went on a field trip I was going to the jet propulsion laboratory in this classroom and I saw engines and jets and, and they were their mission control room. It was at the jet propulsion laboratory. And I told myself I wanted to be just like the men launching rockets, but I had no idea the type of <laughs> side face and not only um, scientific challenges, but emotional challenges in the, in the process of that journey. And to make a long story short uh, in the process of going towards that, goal many different horrible things happen and it, people when they hear about horrible things this is what we call classic definitions of post-traumatic stress uh, i was sexually abused by a, a family member when i was very young trusted by a trusted family member uh, by a friend of a family i should say that was like a family member uh, i went through a gang violence there was somebody who uh, stabbed me in my face almost lost my eye when i was 10 and these things were very traumatic. And uh, shortly after I started failing algebra, geometry, calculus, and chemistry. And I was in this performing arts school and I f found a way to channel my emotions through pretending to be someone else in performing arts. Mm. And uh, there was this teacher who brought me aside and uh, said, well, told everyone in the class, and anyone who wants to uh, understand the mathematics, they're welcome to come during the winter break and understand it so they would uh, do well. And so I didn't have any money to go, but I looked at that as an opportunity. And the gas station attendant knew how much I loved going to school. So he literally gave me a dollar thirty-five so I could catch the bus each way for two hours just to sit with the man for one hour and to learn. Wow. And that was the life-changing moment where I realized I was actually smart. Uh, no one had ever taken the time to uh, show me how to learn. And once I did catch on, I, I could understand it. And it took me a while to completely, deeply understand mathematics, but that, that reignited my, my faith in my own abilities and allowed me to see that the only person who was stopping me was myself, and it was through fear. And I took the math placement test at the AP calculus exam, and I still failed it. But oddly <laughs> enough, <laughs> oddly <laughs> enough, I was still just, I, I had something lit inside of me where failing wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And it, I had become proud of myself. And for the first time ever in my life, I realized that I could do something. And if I spent more time at it, I could actually master it. So... I decided to major in mathematics, and uh, <laughs> the, the, the only this is how ironic it was. The only job that I could get when I uh, entered school was uh, a a math tutoring job. That's how ironic it was. <laughs> I tutored mathematics, and then the person that hired me it was the late Jane Mrs. Pinkerton. She's since on gone to heaven. And I thank her so much. And I remember telling her, I told her, I don't know half of this math. And she said, that's all right. Sit down with the people and learn it with them. Read the book with them. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, are you sure? She says that you'll be fine. Just follow the directions and you'll be able to do it. <laughs> oh, and how so funny. That's what I did. And I did that for five years. 
And I saw thousands of students through the group tutoring programs that was there. And that landed me into becoming one of the top five students at California State University Northridge of the graduates of 1998, uh, in which I was uh, one of the top five out of the 6,500 graduating class for academics. And it was a life-changing experience because I had come from nothing and I realized that through an education, I could change my life. And it it was the formal education at that point in time. Uh, later, uh, one of my co-workers had started working for the Boeing Company. Oh, I should, I should co-students at the time had started working for the Boeing Company. And I ended up contacting them and I started working as kind of like an accountant like a couple of months after graduation. And I ended up working with this man who uh, later took me underneath his wing and he mentored me and I became an official rocket scientist. And it wasn't until like maybe 10 or 15 years after that uh, visit when I was 16, uh, six, when I was six years old, uh, when I realized that I was actually a rocket scientist, like my vision had actually manifested itself years later. And I went on to launch 28 missions to space in the space shuttle, a main engine program. Uh, I authorized engine tests. They, they could not test the engine without my signature. I, I kind of laugh when I say that right now because I'm thinking, oh, my God, my signature was all that. But, yeah, it was. It, it was one of the most stressful jobs, but one of the most thrilling jobs at the same time. But there was something that happened during all of this time experience. I, I rose to the ranks in the rocket science world, and the most craziest thing happened that you would never expect. My mother, the same mother that raised us and that fought so hard to make sure that we'd have a decent education and a decent ch shot at life, even though she didn't have a foundation herself, she was in an accident. And when she was in an accident, she was a pedestrian at the time, and a car came on the curve, and it through the accident, she ended up falling and through the debris from the accident, it hit her head and she ended up having to go through brain surgery. And it was a life or death situation. And the surgeons didn't know whether or not she was going to make it. And at the time when they went into surgery, they saw that she had two broken vertebrae. And uh, that was just crushing to me because it was like, it was my mother going through all of this. And uh, I had my church friends come and we were praying at the hospital and we were literally praying for my mother, praying, praying, praying. And the most miraculous thing happened. She came through the surgery and uh, there were no signs of any broken vertebrae the next day. And that's, that was, that was literally a miracle. And all the doctors and the surgeons were baffled. We were baffled, but that showed me that there was something happening that I couldn't understand and it was had to do with faith. And later on in the years to come, my, my mother would have to learn how to walk and talk and eat and sleep and, and do everything again that we take for granted. But in the process of working with her neuroscientists and, and the doctors and, and the surgeons and the neurologists and physical therapists, I not only had the opportunity to do the work that I was doing at work and, and struggling and making sure to balance everything to help my mother and, and get this work done. Uh, but I also had the ability to understand how the human brain worked. And through helping my mother, I started recognizing how the brains work. I, I look at my own situation where how did I change the way that I was looking at my own life uh, mm -hmm. to reconnect parts of my brain, even though it's separated in trauma. What was I doing to actually later find a way to reconnect these parts and overcome this to, to go into the science and not, not only science, rocket science. Then when I worked with the engineers, I started recognizing what is it that they're doing when they're looking at situations and they're building something from nothing. How do people invent things? How does their brain work to do that? And then when I looked at my mother's situation, how she was going through learning to reconnect her brain and learning to do all the basic activities that we did before and we take it for granted, what separates the people that heal versus the people that don't? 
And this led this research and this understanding and this experience led me to create and form the breakthrough in neuros. I truly believe, I truly feel this is a breakthrough in neuroscience. And it is my new book, Answers Unleashed. Uh, it shows how the brain literally can rewire and reconnect itself after it's gone through trauma, after it's gone through painful experiences, painful memories. And there's a way actually for the brain to heal. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it with the geniuses that I worked with. I've seen it with my mother. And not only that, this is how crazy the whole scenario was. Ten years later, after my mother's accident, after my mother's brain uh, is reconnecting and, and reforming in a completely new way, my sister, my older sister, goes to uh, it, the hospital for a sinus surgery, and there's an accident, and she has infection introduced into her sinus cavity, and she has to go through a brain surgery. Ugh. And I and I think to myself, this is no accident. For me to encounter this type of situation in my in my own life, and then see it happening in the genius lives, how they use their brain, see it happen in my mother's brain, and see it in my sister's brain, the, it was almost like I would be doing a disservice to myself and my path, as well as a disservice to humanity if I didn't write down what it is that I saw, and that led to uh, a couple things happening. My sister now is returned back to work and which is a blessing uh, and I figured out that the same mathematics that we use to launch rockets into space is the same mathematics that we use to reconnect the brain after difficult situations that was the breakthrough now I'm going to try to wrap my head around that one uh, it, it sounds so amazing and did you feel like that, um, and I know I've seen it somewhere in your writing, that there was a, you know, a spiritual or an intuitive aspect of this. And I know that Einstein was a big one on intuition. And, uh, you know, and, and other scientists that I've talked with have talked about, and not always publicly, but have talked about intuition being very, very powerful in their discoveries. So is there that element of, of an intuition or tapping into some kind of larger energy source or higher consciousness? Or Yes, 100%. And I show it with mathematics and science. Uh, le now, let me, if, I, if you will, I'm going to take our audience kind of deep. I'm going to take our audience deep, but I'm going to explain the science in such a way that a five-year-old could walk away with it and really appreciate it. Are you ready? <laughs> That's what I need. Something for a five-year-old to understand. All right. All right. Now this, now, this is groundbreaking future. I'm going to claim it right now. This is groundbreaking future Nobel Prize winning mathematics and information. All right. I, what I learned is this, and this is what I write about in the tree of brain theory of relativity. I first define what the tree of brain is. The true brain is the three-sided brain. It's not just the left-sided brain, which is logical, mathematical, uh, in algebraic type of problem solving and scientific in nature. And it's not just the right brain, which is very creative and expressive and feeling based. But there is another side of the brain that people have not fully understood until now. And it's the third side of the brain I call the faith sector, F-A-I-T-H, faith sector. This faith sector is what connects the left side and the right side together through the nervous system, through uh, all the connections, the muscular and synapsis connections in the entire brain, as well as the nervous system that runs through the body. The brain isn't just in the skull. The brain extends throughout the entire body. Just like a tree has roots, your brain has roots. But if you take it a little step farther, the tree brain theory of relativity says that the brain extends to the entire body 
as well as I use Einstein's theory of relativity to show that the brain also extends in an energy field around the body itself. So your brain not only is in your skull, your brain activity is in your entire body, and there is a field around you through what your brain creates as an energy field around you that carries your thoughts. This particular function, this third part of the brain connects your brain together, connects your brain to your body, and connects your brain, body, and you to your outside world. In how it operates, there's collisions. There's collisions in your brain. There's neurons, which is like brain particles and brain cells, as well as dark mass that I later on will define and, and share with our audience as I call brain brink. It's like this dark tar-like glue that uh, creates itself in the middle of trauma and uh, dysfunctional situations. Well, those blockages create collisions in your brain the collisions in your brain are just like the collisions in space the collisions in space of black holes create gravitational waves and it was just found in recently in 2016 and this is one of einstein's theories that happened 100 years ago well those same type of collisions happen in the brain and when they happen in the brain, your brain sends out its own gravitational wave that I call a tree brain wave. This gravitational wave is your intuition. Everyone has it because everyone's brain has this wave particle through energy that is created through its natural function. Every single one of our brains send out a wave. Here's a perfect example. Have you ever had someone call you when you've been thinking about them? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> that, that is a classic sense of intuition. Your brain is sending out a wave to people for connection. The brain's ability, the natural faith sector, the, brain, the, the gift that we've all been given is the ability for connection. Your brain sends out waves to be connected connected to situations, connected to people, connected to science, connected to physical environments. It's to be connected. So uh, another type of application that people have is what I saw when I worked with the, the engineers. For example, there was this one man that I worked with. He saw a two-story rocket engine presented to him in a dream. And it was so clear to him he had 200 people working, putting together the right material combinations, the, the right uh, heat fluxes, the vibrations necessary to, to create this, this gigantic rocket. And it came from a dream. Our brain naturally has intuition in the form of precognition, which is being able to see things independent of space and time. What this man saw is, the, is a creation before it existed physically. We each have the ability to be able to see things before, the, before they are formed, and our job is to bring it into an existence. That's the classic definition of innovation. Every single person's brain has this ability to invent things. That's what this is. Also, People have intuition in the form of empathy. You, you know how you can look at someone's face and know what they're going through or feeling? Yes. It is because our brains naturally pick up a wave that comes from people's uh, uh, nervous system. And people are able to feel emotions. Like, for example, if you have ever seen a, a world-renowned athlete fall down just inches before the goal line, a, a track star, let's say. And they get up and they have agony and they have pain, but they're limping towards the final, the line. And the entire world is watching and they're weeping. It is because at that very moment, they are watching the, uh, the brain energy of triumph exude from someone that is so strong and so magnificent that is carrying them through the finish line that it literally becomes infectious to everyone that watches that energy. It is uh, the same type of process that stars have. 
the individuals that celebrities, when they get on stage, they're able to use their energy through their movement or their thoughts to be able to change the environment of the audience, to, to make them laugh, to, to allow them to see things. Uh, Olympic athletes are the same way. They see themselves uh, winning before they actually get the goal. It is the natural ability of the brain that we each have. And in my book, Answers Unleashed, I believe it's chapter seven, I break down how to look at your dreams and how to use the particular intuition that you use the most so you can actually change your life and change the lives of people around you by understanding that your intuition is the ability to see a big picture or see the end result before any evidence of it is verified or not. Well, that that's just amazing. You know, and I, I want to get more into, you know, the practical application of these ideas in, you know, for our lives, you know, no matter what the situation is, whether it's pain, you know, physical pain, whether it's emotional pain and, uh, you know, get more into that. And also, you mentioned the dream that the gentleman had of the two-story rocket, and he dreamed it in detail. But I know that there was a dream that you had uh, that was very key in you coming up with these ideas and how to apply them. And when we come back from the break, if you would, please, uh, would you share that dream? You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, it's a dream in the introduction? A dream about uh, wh that where Jesus came. Oh, yeah. I'll share that. Yeah, one. we want to hear about that. <laughs> that was a great one. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more with Olympia LaPointe. I've, I'm dying to call you LaPointe. La I'm, I'm such a Francophile. I've been dying to call you LaPointe all the time. Oh. <laughs> Mademoiselle LaPointe. <laughs> and we will be back with Mademoiselle LaPointe in just a moment. A bientôt. Welcome back to Night Vision. I'm your host, Renee Barnett. If you're just joining us, we've been talking with rocket scientist Olympia LaPointe, and she's been sharing with us uh, not only some bits about her early childhood, which were pretty harrowing. She had a pretty rough uh, upbringing in the mean streets of South Central L.A., where she actually ended up getting stabbed and almost lost her eye. Uh, then she went through a, a horrible accident with her mom, who had a terrible brain injury, but managed to come back from it with help from Olympia and her scientist friends who figured out how to rewire the brain. And also, she got a chance to apply that again 10 years later with her sister, who, through an accident during a surgery, had a brain injury herself. So, nope, that was no accident, I'm sure. That was put right there in front of you for you to see and for you to pick up on, and thank goodness that you did. But before the break, you had mentioned this dream that this man uh, had had about uh, this rocket, this two-story rocket, and he dreamed it in detail on, on, on how to do it. But in your book, you talked about a particular dream that you had where you got information on how to apply science and faith, I'm assuming, to rework the brain. Was that with uh, when your mother was still? Uh, it was actually, thank you for asking that question. I had a very uh, detailed dream. Uh, I was teaching mathematics and it was, uh, my mother was, in recovery she had stabilized within her recovery and uh it was right maybe a year and a half two years before my sister's uh brain surgery and i remember going to sleep one night asking asking god i'm a spiritual person and i remember asking god what what do i do next what do i if i'm not going to go back into rocket science and i'm teaching mathematics i mean how do you want me to use this? I mean, I, I don't even know necessarily what steps to go. And I just, I, I asked for direction. I mean, it was a very sincere prayer. Just show me what to do next, you know. And then I had this uh, amazing dream. And I truly believe dreams are very powerful. If you remember what your dreams are, write them down. They all have a meaning. And uh, each one of the dreams will direct you. And, and my particular dream that I had directed me. 
uh, I had this dream, and in short, I went to sleep, and I had this dream that I was in this school. Uh, it was like this academy. And the one room that we went to, I remember uh, seeing people play the piano with their eyes. And I thought to myself, how is that possible? And then I... In this dream, I started playing the piano with my eyes. And I'm like, oh, I got it. I got a chance to do that, right? <laughs> and oh. then the next part of the dream was people saw a shirt that was orange, and they were then using their thoughts and changing the color of it to be black or changing the color of it to be blue or changing the color to be pink. And they were practicing on changing the, the using their thoughts by changing the, the frequency of the, how the light reflected of the, the, the particles in the shirt. And so I thought, how are they doing that? So in the dream, I did that and I'm like, oh yes, I got it. I got it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, then I went to another room and another room, they had people who were uh, reading thoughts. And then there were uh, people who were laying hands on other people, healing them. And I had learned how to do that in the dream. And I thought, this is amazing. Then the next part, the next room I went to, I saw my mother in there. I'm like, Mommy, what are you doing here? <laughs> and she said, oh, this is my room. I'm designed to show people in this room how to use this gift. And I said, well, what is the gift that you're showing people? And she said, the gift of faith. And so everyone that would come into the room, she showed them how to have faith in a future, even though it didn't exist physically yet. So she was helping people see see what was to come and to have faith in that. And I, I told her, well, are you going to come with me? Progressive presents Get Pumped. Inspiration to help you do insurance stuff. Hey, get your head in the game. This ain't no exhibition match. This is for real. You've got a house to insure and there are no excuses because Progressive's Home Quote Explorer makes it easier than ever to get the coverage you need. Here's some music to get you pumped. Don't chugga 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 meow meow meow. Don't chugga 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 feel that confidence. Don't chugga chugga chugga. Did I say stop saving money? No. Don't chugga 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 meow meow meow. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Me to the other room. She says, No, no, no. My job is to stay here in this room, honey. You go on to the other places. So, it, this may sound like a nuance of the dream, but I said, "Well, where do I put my purse and stuff?" She goes, "Put it in this locker over here and keep going." <laughs> 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 so I, I did it. I did what my mother said in the dream, right? And then I went over to this other place. And then I, I, I finished. I went through all the rooms in this academy. And I'm like, is there anything more to do? And, I, and then I exited. And then I exited in this, uh, it was kind of like this amphitheater. And I exited in this amphitheater. And I went to the the amphitheater and I looked around it was just no one there it was like this Greek amphitheater where you know how the stage goes down and you can see like rows and rows down and there's a stage there at the bottom well I looked and it was come out into this empty space and I got into this amphitheater area and then I saw this man and this man was there and he was in the middle of the theater and he rose up and he hovered and he came to the front top of the stairs where I was and he told me something and he told me he looked at me and how he looked at me, he didn't use his mouth, but he just used his thoughts. And he said, you've graduated. You've now learned how to use your brain. Now, and then I started to wake up. And I heard these words so clearly as I was waking up. And as I was waking up, I heard, now your job is to show people on earth what their brains can do. Mm -hmm. And I woke up. And uh, that that dream was just so powerful. And I remember calling up my three good friends that uh, uh, I talk to all the time. I'm like, Can't, I had this dream. I had this dream. And and so I, I just asked for them to pray for me and to uh, just keep me in their thoughts to, to figure out how on earth was I going to do this. I, I didn't have the, I didn't know the process or the, the map or the roadmap to do that, but I just knew that I really truly wanted to honor this ability to to show them all these really cool things that I learned in the dream. And through the course of that time frame, that happened back in 2005. 
no, no, 2000, in 2015, excuse me, 2015. That happened in 2000, that dream happened in 2015. And then a year, uh, I brainstormed and started writing a little bit about the book. Uh, and then the Answers Unleashed talk show that I started, uh, a radio show, uh, came about the next year. And it was like, mer- is finding the answers with in front of you using science and faith. And then that, a year late, uh, kind of like a year and a half later, led to the book Answers Unleashed. And it's all been just a, a unfolding onion. You know how there's like layers and layers and layers to an onion? It's like... Mm-hmm. It's like one, you take off one piece and there's another deeper piece and there's another deeper piece. And it's just, it's amazing what I learn about the brain. And as I learn it, I share it. And it was the most amazing thing to be able to see that everything scientific that happens has a mirror image spiritually. So the same things that happen in the spiritual realm can be seen in the scientific realm. They're like the two sides of the same coin. But if you really want to go deep, how energy forms and works and how we translate energy, that's in our brain, that's intuition. So if you will think of a three-sided coin, if you will, and you have to really use your imagination to see this, the things that happen in the spiritual realm has the same mirror image that happens in the physical world through science. And science represents a spiritual principle and it's a physical manifestation of a, a spiritual principle. Now, if you really want to go deep, you pair that with energy. The scientific world has energy related to it. And that's what Einstein was showing. And that's what he was talking about intuition. Uh, energy, when we create and manipulate and change energy, it's through our thoughts. It's through our brain. So we can change energy, we can change rays, we can change temperatures through our thoughts. And and we do this all the time in our own body. And people are not even aware of that. Our thoughts are geared towards shifting and changing energy so it can be molded and shaped into the physical world that we need to be able to do whatever it is that we are set out to do. So the spiritual world can be reflected in our thoughts and our thoughts is what shifts the energy to create physical things in science it's all related it's all connected together through this three-way process and you know it's almost easier for me to understand how this can apply to something like a brain injury or you know because it all has to do with you know, electrical and wiring and, mm-hmm. and 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 all that. But what about other physical maladies? Uh, you know, uh, chronic disease and things like that. Is this applicable to that as well? Is there a way to to heal your body, rewiring your brain? Yes, yes. And I write about that in my book. Uh, uh, when we go through very difficult situations, there's such thing called brain brink that forms in our brain. Uh, in brain brink, as I define in the book, it's like this glue-like, tar-like mass that sticks the brain together. Like, when we go through very traumatic situations, our l- brain literally almost separates itself. But in order to keep it from separating, it creates a instantaneously like this glue that keeps it from falling apart. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the best way for me to describe it. And it happens that when we have very stressful situations, there's over 1,400 different chemical reactions that happen in the brain. Cortisol is released, adrenaline increases, our uh, blood pressure goes up, and we have higher temperature. We get, literally cook ourselves in a certain way when we go through stress, literally. I mean, that sounds strange. And so this our brain creates a substance when we go through stress. Now, if we don't relieve the stress and if we no longer, if if we don't find a way to remove the thoughts that are associated with a very difficult event, the thoughts still are in our head that keep this energy at this temperature and at this pressure and, and of this physical state. So if we are continuously stressed, my theory in the theory of relativity is that Brain brink is this dark tar-like mass that hardens in the brain, 
that keeps the brain from reshaping itself. And since the brain is not only in the head and it goes throughout the entire body, this brain brink is dark tar-like mass that can happen anywhere. It can happen in an organ of the pancreas. It can happen within the colon. And, and I also in the book describe what chaos theory mathematics does is that there's things in the body that represent certain areas. Like, for example, the colon, how it turns around in, in different crooks and crannies is the mirror image of how the crooks and crannies work in the brain. Uh, your hips have a mirror image and it is your cheekbones, but it's like a mirror image upside down. So if you have, if you've been uh, hit in the face, your hips are going to hurt because there's a mirror imaging mathematical effect in the body that represents what's going on. So if you have any type of brain brink of dark tar-like formation in your brain from a specific trauma, and it's not removed through several different methods in which I share in the book, uh, through uh, hypnotherapy, through a cognitive behavioral therapy, through a method called voila uh, method therapy. If if it's not removed through one of these, if this dark tar-like mass is not removed uh, in parts of the brain, it will have a mirror effect in the body somewhere. Like for example, yeah, uh, someone who is having a a very very difficult uh, time digesting food but it may have a very difficult time uh, with their sinuses because the esophagus in the body is similar to the bridge of the nose. That's how it lo- that's how there's these mirror images mathematically that happen not only in our body, but they also happen in our lives as well. So uh, when we experience sickness and disease, it's because there is a trapped thought that we are unaware of that is converting energy to be harmful in that one area. When we are able to identify the thought that is associated with a stressful situation, we then are able to remove that thought and replace it with a new one so the energy from the situation converts properly in our body so it can unleash healing and innovation inside of us and through us. Now, I can understand how that would work, um, obviously, if you've developed illnesses, as, as we do, because of uh, emotional trauma and or, you know, some sort of, uh, like you said, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or something like that. What about, is it the same for, what about diseases that, you know, some people are born with things or developed a disease as a small baby and then, you know, have them throughout their lives. Is there something uh, that can work with that as well? Mm, uh, there's, there's, there's a fine line and that's a great question. There's some things in which uh, we, I'm a firm believer that some things that we are born with that we are, that we look as a very difficult thing, but really it's a blessing in disguise. And no matter what, you always have it because it's going to serve your purpose. Uh, for example, uh, my biological father, unfortunately, is an alcoholic. And uh, he's very uh, addicted to uh, different alcohols and, and drugs and, and of that sort. Mm-hmm. So uh, I knew growing up that this addictive gene existed within my DNA. So, it, oddly enough, I always I knew that I never wanted to experience that. And so I always did everything I could to avoid any type of situation that would make my brain addicted to anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it, it was a blessing. And, and so I talk about this in the book. Sometimes things that are very difficult uh, difficult and we think oh it's a it's a horrible thing it's really a blessing in disguise because if you're able to take the energy from that situation you're able to translate it into a beneficial way by your thoughts and a perfect example was a a person i name in the book by name of glenn he had a a very similar situation he grew up with an alcoholic father but he lived with his father and he had a situation where his father was abusive so they, him and his brother never knew when there was going to be an outburst from his father, and they always lived on edge. But at the same time, he learned to read his father like there was no tomorrow. 
He learned to be able to read any time when his father was had alcohol in the system versus when he didn't. Uh, he learned how to determine when his father was going to be logical versus not. And he learned everything from the mannerisms and, and how he moved his arms to be able to determine what type of emotion someone was having. Well, he later on went into the field of sales, technical sales, computerized system sales. And he became a billionaire <laughs> because he would become so great at reading people's intentions to know what their hidden thoughts were based on their movements, how their eyes worked, how what they said, if they were actually aware versus just talking. He became such a, a great person at being able to read people that he was able to read the people that were going to give him sales. And he learned to be able to use that, that horrible experience from growing up to benefit him in a way that was actually going to help himself and other people within his career. So wow. when we have difficult situations, it's actually a uh, blessing. But you have to change your view of the situation so you can use the energy from the situation to your benefit. Uh, uh, this is I, I have this test for people. When they go through very stressful situations and they don't want to go through a situation anymore, there's such thing as letting go. And when we make a decision to let go of how something is going to affect us, that's when we gain our power. And uh, for example, if you are dealing with a very difficult, very difficult coworker, and you cannot stand that person at <laughs> all, and you, you just don't want to work with that person whatsoever, there's a way to actually deal with them. And it's actually a mental exercise that changes the situation. Okay, for example, if you're dealing with a very stressful situation and the person is very difficult to work with and you cringed even being in a meeting with that person, oh, you can actually shift the energy of the situation so that person doesn't create the energy that will, that will rise your blood pressure or make you stress. And this is what I call the pleasure principle. And this is the exercise in my book. You sit with the person you, before you go into the room or before you meet with them, you decide you have, you have to set your intention before anything. You decide I'm going to let go of any negative energy and I'm going to deflect it by my own awareness. I'm going to deflect it. I'm only going to accept the energy that's good. Now you've got to, you've got to set that intention out before you do anything, before you meet with anyone, before you do anything else. And then you use this pleasure principle. So whenever you meet with a person, before you meet with them, you think of the most pleasurable experience you can imagine from when you were the smallest child. So if it was playing with your, your grandmother, or if it was uh, talking with a parent, or if it was being on the swing outside, whatever it was, you remember that feeling and you hold on to it and you taste it, smell it, feel it, you enjoy it. You would, you at that moment of time of recalling that memory is in releasing endorphins in your brain, the pleasure mm. endorphins in your brain. So by you recalling that experience, you're actually commanding a chemical, a certain chemical reaction in your brain to happen naturally. So as soon as you go into this meeting with this person that you can't stand, <laughs> <laughs> you go into this place and you look at the person that you can't stand. But as you look at the person, you think of your wonderful time that you had when you were a child and you overlay it. You overlay the two realities. So you're looking at the person, but you're really looking at what you experienced as a child. When you do this, the energy from that situation no longer has an effect on your consciousness. You've literally then shifted the energy from your own thoughts and from your own being to deflect whatever that person is trying to throw at you. Sort of like an invisible shield, huh? Yes. Yes. Yes, and it, it's so interesting. There was this concept was actually presented uh, within Harry Potter. At the, it's 
the strangest wow. thing. It was it presented in Harry Potter uh, in the Expecto Patronum charm, and it actually this particular process actually can be applied to the human brain. When you envision a pleasurable situation, you then command your brain to actually release the endorphins that you need to be able to face whatever situation that's in front of you. And when you have those endorphins, they they cannot coexist with stress hormone. So whatever is going to happen in the meeting, it will literally bounce off of you. And because you have then set your thoughts to exist within a certain type of situation, you then have waves that create from you that affect the other person and not the other way around. Wow. You know, I, I think I think we all know people that, you know, when they walk, you're talking about endorphins and, and that concept. And, and when they walk into the room and they have this big smile and it's just as though the sun is shining in the room and you feel it and it lightens the room and it makes everyone feel good. But by the same token, uh, there are some people that when they walk into the room, they seem to be so negative and they just seem to suck out all the air out of the room. And that seems like that would be a really good process to use when you know that you're going to have that kind of an encounter. You know, oh, I, we, we've yes. all had coworkers or, or even friends, you know, that <laughs> sort of are, are, you know, negative Nellies and, uh, it's it's kind of difficult to prepare yourself. So I'm just like, oh gosh, the phone's ringing. It's her. Oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. But if you can get yourself into that little space really quickly, then I'm going to try that. I think that yeah, sounds. It great. works. It acts. It, it, and the deep the the memory that you have from the this younger you ha- are, that is most powerful because they've had the longest time to reside in your memory base to create the deepest endorphins. Ah, so that's why it's good to choose something from childhood. Yes, because it has the deepest, most profound, long existing chemical reaction in your brain. Oh, wow. Well, that's Isn't that amazing. fascinating? <laughs> it really, really is. We got some great uh, questions coming out of the chat room. I'm going to throw one at you really quickly just before we go to the break here, uh, because it's going to be an easy one. Uh, Let's see, who was it? Jo- Jose Livingston says, how did she get the name Olympia? Sounds very epic and regal. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. What's his name? Who said that? Jose. Jose, thank you, Jose. Can I give you like a <laughs> kiss all online? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I- I told I told him Olympia means home of the gods. Oh, do you know Olympia? Yeah, Olympia was ge- a name given to the human that was like the gods that had the ultimate union between mind, body, and soul. Oh my gosh! Yeah, isn't that funny? <laughs> and that yeah. was your that was your birth name. No, that is that Olympia Lapointe is my birth name on my birth certificate. Yeah. Now, yeah. how did your mom choose that name? She was watching Soul Train. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was watching this group. Uh, I don't even know. She told me and I forgot. There was this group she was watching on Soul Train and one of the people's name was Olympia Ann. And she says, oh, what a wonderful name. And so she was going to name me Muriel at first. And then uh, she was uh, gung-ho. She was all ready to name me Muriel. Until it, this is in 1976 when they had the Muriel cigars, and the n- the nurse came into the room and she said, "Oh, you're gonna name her Muriel like the cigar?" Oh, my mother went into a panic and she quickly got rid of the name Muriel, and the first name that came up in her mind was Olympia Ann, from when she saw, oh, the Silvers. That's what their name. Oh, they the were Silvers. Silvers. Yeah. There was a band. Uh, there's a member named Olympia Ann, and she saw them on Soul Train, and that's what I was named after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so wild. I love that. That's amazing. Well, thank God she did that. Thank God oh, for that nurse. Yes. I like Olympia so much better than Muriel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It is a beautiful name. And you know what? When we come back, we're going to have more with Olympia. And we're going to find out more about how to apply her theories to our own lives. When we come back, stay with us. <laughs> 
And we're back with Night Vision Radio. I'm your host, Renee Barnett. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We've been talking with Olympia LaPointe, and we've been talking about her new book, Answers Unleashed, and her ideas and theories about how to rewire the brain for success and for lots of other good things. Now, um, we were talking about, you know, illnesses and um Someone asked the question, and now did I go uh, past it here? Uh, Tall White is the name of this person. Can our brains really help us block out physical pain on demand? Mm. Uh, Pain is actually a good thing. (laughs) You're like, what on earth is this woman saying? Yeah, pain is a good thing. Pain happens when, when your body is not, when you're been having ignoring something and that is the last case result when your body is trying to make you consciously aware of something in which has been hidden that is no longer serving you pain is the last resort there will be this is the type of uh, hierarchy uh, process first you'll feel kind of like uncomfortable then you'll feel discomfort and then you'll feel anxious and then you'll feel pain so it's like a, a process. And so when you feel discomfort, that's like the first sign for like what's going on. And so when people experience pain, it's when your body is so uh, not aligned with your conscious is not aligned with your subconscious that it has to trigger something inside of you to make a shift. Mm. That's what it is. Pain is actually a good thing. And the longer... Uh, you, as long as you do not listen to your uh, your intuition, your higher self, and your your ability to know the truth, the pain will exist. Now, there's pains that happen from like injury. Yeah, they're like people fall off a, a bike or break something. Yeah, or go through a surgery. Yeah, th- there's such thing as real pain, and people that go through surgery have scar tissues and everything else like that. Uh, but there's usually some sort of a thought that's hidden from you that's making the pain feel worse than it is. Mm. So when you identify what that is, the pain doesn't have the same physical effect on the mind and body, and it allows that ease for your body to actually heal itself. Wow. So even in cases where there is, it's real pain, like someone, as you said, has had surgery, or maybe someone, uh, what about something like uh, a condition like arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis or something where people experience a lot of chronic pain? Is that applicable there to make that pain have less of an effect? Well, um, that is, do, well, and I'm, again, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, so this is best for a medical doctor, but my theory is, uh, that when we experience inflammation, it is it uh, when we experience arthritis, it's because there is an overflux of infl- inflammation in the body that the body is trying to fight and get rid of. Mm. Inflammation comes in very different forms. It comes from poor digestion. It comes from uh, uh, poor substances we put into our system. It comes from even joint misalignment. So there's certain things like. Uh, going to a chiropractors that help going to physical therapists where the uh, a kinesiologists were who are able to uh, create the the muscle realignment so joints actually function in the correct angular movement and even there's a, something that I, in the book that I call voila method it is a combination of cranial sacral adjustments which are you uh, gently adjust the joint muscles in the skull and you uh, combine that with muscular movements and it makes someone aware of what their thoughts are in conjunction with different pain and, and bodily movements in the in, inability to move in certain areas so it's a new form of science uh, and and spirituality that has been formed by um, kinesiologist Joel Crandall, and so I, I really highly recommend his work. Also, when people want to remove inflammation, he has a training system of people across the world that he's been training in this new method of kinesiology, and it is uh, helping people remove the inflammation from their body that is causing the pain in different areas. Yeah. Wow, that would be an amazing thing. Um, 
You know, Adriana in the chat room says, hey, Renee, there was a recent study that came out this week that claims being negative helps us live longer. What the heck is that all about? I, I, I haven't heard about that. I, I can't imagine how that could be true. <laughs> I, I don't know. You'd have to tell me the study that came from. I would love to find out the link. But yeah, you're probably sapping everybody's energy. <laughs> yeah, you live so. longer in misery. <laughs> you'll, live, you'll live long, but you'll be alone. So, you'll live longer in misery. That's what that is. <laughs> Adriana, if you know what that study is, shoot me a link or something, and I'll I'll pass it along to Olympia later. <laughs> I would like to see what that is all about. That's just so crazy. Now, I, I want to get, if I could, just a little bit into um, your work at NASA. And, um, you know, a lot of us saw the movie Hidden Figures, and you've been called by People Magazine and others, you know, real-life hidden figure because of your work there. And a lot of people, you know, probably do a, a lot of work at NASA that's kind of unsung. But what I'm wondering is, in this climate i guess this me too climate mm. did you run into problems not i'm i'm not necessarily trying to ask if you were sexually harassed but more uh discriminated against because of of being a woman had have you try was someone trying to hold you back or is that something that you just don't want to talk about oh well I, 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 i'm very real um when i worked as a rocket scientist i love the science but working as a woman young woman of color was one of the most hardest jobs i had ever encountered well, that was a I, double whammy oh uh, i know it was a woman and a woman of color and being young on top of it when most of the people are 20 years older than i was at least oh, uh, it whammy. was <laughs> and, and, and it's so crazy. I launched. I started launching rockets twenty years ago. That's what's the most amazing thing. That was twenty years ago. And this is uh, when I saw the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, it not much had changed. Thirty years had passed, and I was doing this work, and not much had changed. And it was the most oddest thing because when I watched the movie, I was like, oh, "That's like my life." And it was very challenging. And I, I'm not going to tell something that's not true. I uh, it was very challenging. I love the science, uh, but I had to I had to work. I had to I had to work and I worked twice as hard. And uh Progressive presents Get Pumped. Inspiration to help you do insurance stuff. Okay, time out. You're gonna let your budget be the boss of you? Take control with Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay for car insurance, and we'll help you find options that fit your budget. Here's some music to get you pumped. Da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -dang -dang. I hear your budget laughing at you. Oh, wait, that's just those kids laughing at me. Ignore them! Da -dum -da -dum -da Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Uh, it was uh, challenging because there were many times. Uh, uh, the first, the second day I was there, uh, this man came up <laughs> and he circled around me. Like I was a museum piece. Like he had his mouth open, he had it dropped, and he circled around me. And I remember looking at him thinking, do I have like something on my shoe or do I have something like <laughs> on my top? You know, what's wrong? Is what's going on? And he just circled around me. He walked off and I didn't know what was happening. And then these women came over to me. He, they were uh, the executive administrators. They were the what we used to call secretaries. They were the individuals who work for the executives who are women. And I didn't even know who they were. And they pulled me over to a side and they said, uh, you don't know us, but we're women who've been working up here in a long time. And that guy that just circled around you, he's one of the good guys. And I'm like, oh, God. God. Uh, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Who are you? <laughs> this is like a Twilight Zone movie, right? And I was like, oh, what's, what's going on? And they said, just to let you know, there's some men, not all, but there's some men that will do anything to push your button to get you emotional to try and make it prove that you don't deserve this job. You're one of the first women that has been working here on this floor for the last 15 years. And we're just telling you this because anytime they try and do something, you have to keep your cool and never let them see you cry. And I'm like, what? And, and they said, and if you ever get emotional, pull us into the restroom and talk it out with us. But whatever you do, keep your cool because there's, 20 different men that want your job. 
Wow. And and I I remember thinking to myself, think that's the can't be true. It can't be true. Lo and behold, the next week in a meeting, it happens. And I think to myself, oh my God, they were accurate. And it was like that for 10 years. Now it wasn't everybody, but there were a select handful that had that mentality. And it was a challenge. It wasn't only a challenge making making sure things didn't explode. And <laughs> Yeah. But it was also, it was a challenge to, so I didn't explode. <laughs> <laughs> it was a challenge, so I remained calm. And I, I had to learn the process to allow people to see the science for what it was, independent of who it was presenting it to them. And it worked, and I eventually rose to the top of the ranks and, and earned Modern Day Technology Leader Award of Engineer of the Year because of this work. Wow. And it was a challenge, but I looked at it as every single day it was a choice to get up and go, and it wasn't easy. Uh, but I knew that it was all going to pay off somehow, some way. And I was there doing the science, and I just knew that somehow, some way, my life was going to make a difference in this world and in that environment. And it was just to hold on and to keep moving. And uh, after 10 years of working there, I rose to the ranks of, of being in, in, the, uh, sub, in the room supporting mission control. And had I <laughs> resigned the, the second day... <laughs> I would have never been able to rise to that rank and later be able to inspire people across the world to defeat odds. And still Absolutely. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing story. Um, Rhett Stone in the chat room says, I wonder what she thinks about the rockets that North Korea keeps toying around with. you have any opinion on that or... Mm, uh, I, I just, I'm going to state what a fact is. North Korea is not as technically advanced in the aerospace world with rockets as Russia is or the United States right. or, or um, a couple of other areas. Uh, they're still learning their technology. And it's the, 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 this is the part of natural testing. Uh, and I think sometimes the media will hype it in a certain direction to... Uh, that is not necessarily accurate. And um, it all depends on who you talk to. But testing t testing different items of uh, is a part of the process. Where it's tested is a whole other story. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but uh, the United States and Russia is probably the, the most superior when it comes to the rocket building and launching uh, in the world. Sure, sure. Now... I cannot let the show end because I would get uh, I would never hear the end of it from my listeners if I did not ask you this question. <laughs> what? What do you think about UFOs? Oh! <laughs> from the standpoint of rocket scientists. Oh my gosh! Do you know what I asked? I have a very very dear close friend who's an astronaut, and I I, I have, he's he. He's such a great friend. And I asked him that same question. <laughs> I yeah. asked him, like, you've been up in space. Have you ever seen anything, right? <laughs> and there's certain things he's classified and he can't tell me. So that was really interesting. And uh, let me just share this with you. A lot of things that we see as UFOs are actually being tested and they can't be presented to the public uh, sure. because of security reasons. And so that is quite... That, that happens a lot. There's a lot of things. And we just saw that. We saw SpaceX just uh, test a, a, a missile over Los Angeles, and it was captured all across the world. And everyone thought it was a UFO at first until SpaceX said, that was our rocket. <laughs> except, for, except for Elon Musk, who tweeted, it was definitely aliens. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but I will share with you something like this. And this is, this is a real-life experience of mine. Are you ready? Yeah, I remember traveling on the 210 freeway in Los Angeles, and it was at late at night. This is maybe like 15 years ago, and I remember traveling on the road. Now, now, mind you, I do believe that a lot of things, a lot of unidentified flying objects, is really uh, majority of it is actually uh, 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 military testing, military uh, 
uh, top secret type of work. I really do believe that. Uh, but there was this one time I was traveling on the freeway and I looked up and I saw this, these lights and it was circular. And I thought at first it was like a, uh, you know how they have an electric grid where they have different lights and stuff like that. And I, and I thought my eyes were right. tricking me. And I thought to myself, it must be some electric grid. And I, and I got closer and closer. And it was to the top of this mountain. It was like, it's uh, in the uh, uh, Latuna Pass of the Teton Freeway in Los oh, Angeles. Oh, yeah. Latuna Canyon, and, yeah. Yeah, Latuna Canyon. And I was passing it and I got closer and closer. And I looked up and I'm like, that's no grid. And I looked up and looked up. It was the bottom of something that was flying. Wow. And I remember thinking to myself, ah! and I, the first thing that came to mind was all those like UFO movies that <laughs> people watch, you know, and like how like all this time like elapses and there's days that go by and they don't know where they are. So I like, I started thinking about all these like UFO horror movies and stuff. And so <laughs> <laughs> that moment I thought to myself, well, I am not going to find out what it is. I put my foot on the gas and I looked at the time and I said, time better not elapse. And I put, <laughs> <laughs> and I put that uh, pedal to the metal and I got out of there. I still to this day do not know what that is. As, as a result, because I did not know what it is, it is officially an unidentified flying object. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> That is pretty scary, especially, you know, if you're out there. That's that's a pretty sparsely populated area. Yeah, so there's nobody over there. Not I, I, I would mountain. much rather be, you know, anywhere in the heart of the city than in some <laughs> remote area and then something like that comes upon me. But yeah, that but, so yeah, did it, it looked look like it was. really, really big. It was huge. And I, I just I just did not want to look up. <laughs> I saw enough. And I said to myself, I'm a scientist, but I'm not that curious. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> not, not right now, anyway. Now, but if I could ask you as a scientist and, and, and just as a person in thinking about, you know, the universe and, you know, you've you've had a lot more uh, acquaintance with outer space than most people. Does it seem to you likely that this would be the only place where there would be intelligent life in the in the vast, vast universe that we now know is millions and millions and millions of planets and millions of planets older than than ours and even galaxies much, much older? Wouldn't it stand a reason that we wouldn't be the only ones? Uh, it's interesting. I was brought on uh, KTLI 5 Morning News uh, for the uh, new space system that came out. And if anyone wants to find it, they can go to uh, my website, AnswersUnleashed.com, or my YouTube site uh, at uh, uh, YouTube. And you type in Olympia Point or, or Oral Consulting is what it's under. And uh, there's an episode of me where I'm talking about uh, if intelligent life can be on different planets, and they just from this solar system that was just found. And uh, it was a, a, a Trappist one. It was Trappist one solar system. I talk about how far it was, and what type of planets, and uh, what type of elements that would be needed to to sustain things. There's a couple of elements that's needed to sustain intelligent life. It would need to be water and a gaseous environment. Anything that actually will sustain life will have an environment where uh, there's a type of way for the solar system or planets to actually have a gaseous system of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. Um, to be able to create different type of chemical reactions on the planet so there could actually be life. And it's, it's quite fascinating because uh, life is defined in, per our terms and our understanding by those type of uh, components in a solar system. Uh, for, for the probability of there being just intelligent life here on Earth, it's, it's almost zero, the probability of us being the only intelligent life form it's i personally think it's just arrogant for us to think that because there's literally mathematically speaking there's billions of planets there there really are and i was reading an article just this week that uh i saw i can't remember uh the origin i think it was on apple news about how the habitable area uh 
of the of our solar system is going to, is going to be shifting. I mean, not anytime soon, but there will be a period when it becomes uninhabitable to be on Earth, and that we will shift to places like Mars because that environment will change as ours does and become more habitable. Uh, well, this is after a long period of time. That won't happen sure. in our lifetime. Uh, no. That won't happen within the next, I, I might estimate that that won't even happen in the next two three, or 3,000 years. Uh, the issue with traveling to Mars, and this is what they don't tell individuals, is that the gravitational forces for them to get to Mars requires uh, them to use chaos theory, so w which will literally throw the rocket in certain places. And so when it does that, it has different uh, gravitational forces that happen within the, the rocket itself. There's no evidence that a human can actually sustain that type of force on the human body. Like, for example, when the astronauts go out into space, uh, in the space shuttle main engine, uh, space shuttle program itself, it could not accelerate fully to 34,000 miles an hour because if it did it straight zero to 34,000 miles an hour, 34,000 miles an hour to get up into space, it was going to cause too much pressure on the chest of the astronauts, and the astronauts were literally, their chests were literally cave in. So that's why you saw the, the, the engine throttle back, then throttle up, throttle back, and throttle up, and throttle back, and throttle up, and finally accelerate to give the pressure, to alleviate the pressure off the humans so they could actually get there. And they still were in pressurized suits, mind you. So there is no... Uh, guarantee that humans could actually sustain the type of gravitational pulls and forces that it takes and requires to get to Mars. And that's why there's such, there's people signing up to go, but there's also no uh, guarantee of people being able to return. And that's what the whole uh, story of the Martian was about, because there's no guarantee that people can actually return from that type of environment. So uh, that's just a little bit of a science background of that. Uh, but we will see a shift, but it's not going to be in any time in our lifetime. But the, the I really truly believe that our job here on Earth right now is to clean it up and make it an environment so the Earth can heal itself. It, the Earth is a living organism. Just like we have a north and a south pole to the Earth and it has its axis, there's a mirror reflection in our brains. Our brains have a north and south pole in it as well. We have a northern part, which is the top part, and we have a southern part, which is like the bottom part uh, that at uh, the base of our neck. And so we have, just like we have, the Earth has an axis. Our brain has an axis, just like our the Earth turns and rotates. We have gravitational forces in our brain that actually rotates at a similar way. The the whole universe and Earth is mirroring one another. So. Just like we have to clean up our brains, we have to clean up the earth. And, and I think it's our responsibility to, to heal the earth and, and find ways to be able to uh, change its environment so we can respect what we've been given. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that it's incumbent upon us to take care of our planet so it can take care of us. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I want I want to remind people before we go, we've got just a few more minutes. I want to remind people again, the name of the book is Answers Unleashed, The Science of Unleashing Your Brain's Power. Yes. I have it. I suggest you get it, too. Ooh. And it's an amazing book. It's it, it's really great. It, it, it's a, a mixture of Olympia's personal story and science and faith and intuition. It is really really something and um i'm going to read it to cover to cover and you know what i'm going to give it to my kids to read too because um i think that anyone could find it helpful especially someone as you said who's been through some kind of trauma and um and there's a lot of us out there who have been oh yes thank you so much i really enjoy it uh uh, the book is written, it's it's groundbreaking science. It's Nobel Prize winning science, but it's explained in people's real life stories. So I explain the science in drama and sagas and, and so people can understand not only the physical equations that are very easy to understand, but it's also the science behind what really goes on. And uh, there's, if people go to AnswersUnleashed.com, they can do two things. They can buy the book if they're interested in it. It's on Amazon and it's also downloadable, which is great. Uh, it's on all the different downloadable platforms for the book uh, from the the nook to the kindle as well as you can get it on amazon but also california state university northridge uh, had me come through as a celebrity guest lecturer 
And they had me give a one hour lecture about the contents of the book. And the great news is that anyone can find out about the contents of the book by watching the free video online. So mm. it's a one hour lecture. It's on answersunleashed.com slash live lectures. So when you go there, you can actually play the YouTube video and you can find out about how your brain works. And it is, it's an Answers Unleashed live lecture. And uh, it, we are creating the 2018 tour, uh, going to different places and giving this. There's so much to learn. This is just what you'll see in the, in the video is just a portion of what is in the book. And when you watch what's in this one hour video, you'll be floored. And there's, there's a series involved for you to find out so much more about what's going on. Well, I tell you, I did watch some of those lectures uh, online, and there's a lot of really good stuff on there. There's also uh, broadcasts from, from your podcast, and each one of those is really interesting. That's where what gave me actually some of the ideas uh, that I wanted to explore with you on pain and some of the other things that uh, I saw on your on your website. It's just amazing. And that's on your Unleashed website. Right? Yes. Yeah, everything is. Uh, I create the Answers Unleashed platform, and it is podcasts. It's a it's a different show that I hold every single week. We're on break right now, but season five returns in February. Uh, it's the Answers Unleashed book, which is there. If you go to the book's website, you can actually uh, look at the the video uh, from uh, me on different shows. We're talking about the books, and then you actually have the live lecture.